Happy Easter, everyone. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Uh, Christ is risen indeed. Uh, and welcome to all of you, um, especially if you're joining us for the first time. A very special welcome to you. And uh, I really hope uh, that uh, today will refresh your souls and you'll keep coming back. And God will give you the thirst to keep hearing from His Word uh, and be refreshed. And now every Sunday that we meet together uh, is very special. Um, but especially Easter is perhaps the most memorable uh, and joyous uh, in the Christian calendar. So on Friday, we, we reflected uh, on the death of Jesus on the cross for our sins. And we looked at the concept of being, Jesus swapping our sins uh, for his righteousness. And we also saw how the, the cross is foolishness to those who don't believe. But to those who do believe, it is a source of eternal life. And so today, two days later, we're going, to, we're going to reflect on Jesus being resurrected, Him being raised to life again, and we're going to give glory and praise to God uh, for doing that. So as we get into today's, today's service, uh, I'm, going, I'm going to pray, but before that, I want to read, uh, I want to read a few verses um, from the first letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians where he talks about the importance of resurrection, and he says this, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. The resurrection of Jesus is so foundational to the Christian faith. Then without it, our faith has no basis. So today, uh, Ben will be teaching us from Ezekiel 37, uh, which talks to us about we are dry and we have no life. So if Christ wasn't resurrected, we have no hope. But with Christ being resurrected, we have all the hope that we need. So Ben will teach us from Ezekiel 37, and uh, Aisha, one of our sisters, will be te telling us about how that hope has transformed her life. So as we get into today's service, let me pray and lead us in prayer and commit this time to God. Please bow with me. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Father, for who you are. Uh, we thank you, Father, that you've sent your only Son to die on the cross for us. And we thank you, Father, that he has swapped our sins for his righteousness so that we can be found right before you. And Father, we thank you, Father, that you did raise Christ from the dead and we thank you, Father, that gives us all the hope that we need. And we pray that as we get into today's service, we pray that your Spirit will remind us of that truth. He will refresh us, refresh our souls, uh, so that we'll live lives that are transformed and for you. And I pray this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. I want to now invite the music team uh, who are going to lead us in Christ the Lord is risen today. So let's reflect on this great news as we sing together. Joy is 
and Millie uh, are going to uh, speak to us, uh, speak to us kids especially, but to everyone uh, about this great hope uh, that we have in Christ. So all the kids, please come. Uh, there's plenty of carpet space in the front for you to sit down, uh, and I'll hand over to Naomi and Millie. Hi kids, welcome. It's good to see you all here. We're excited to be able to um, share with you Easter Sunday and Resurrection Sunday. Uh, this is Millie, I'm Naomi, um, and we want to share with you some great news. Uh, we want to share with you why we are so um, excited about today, um, about this Sunday. Um, about something that happened a long, long time ago. Um, we want to share with you about a great hope that we have, uh, a hope that, um, that is about our future. Hmm, hope is a strange word, Naomi. Can you tell me what hope means again? Hope is a strange word. It can be hard to describe. Um, hope is when we are thinking something about our future, um, and we want to let you know that Easter gives us a great hope um, that we can actually know what is going to happen, that we can know for certain our future. Um, Easter gives us a great hope of uh, being made clean and together with Jesus. That sounds great. So, do you mean like how I can be sure that it's school holidays tomorrow or I'm going to get some yummy chocolate Easter eggs today? Uh, I'm thinking of like an even better hope. I'm not sure, Millie, if you can be sure that your parents are going to give you Easter eggs today. Hmm, I guess not. But this hope thing does sound pretty cool. Sometimes things in life don't seem pretty sure, like if my friends will be nice to me, or if I'll get sick in the holidays. And sometimes I even worry about scary thunderstorms. Yeah, life can be pretty scary We're, and very uncertain. We're not always sure what's going to happen. Uh, our parents might not know what job they'll have next year or when they'll see their family next. Uh, and many people are actually afraid of dying because they don't know what's going to happen after death. Hmm, this reminds me of something that I made for my friends. I hope that it would turn out good, but something went wrong. Can I show it to you guys? Yep. Ooh, what's this? Can I get someone up to help me look what's in it? show it to everyone? Hold it up high. It's a, a, a cookie, I think. Can you smell it? What's it smell like? Nothing. Nothing. It smells kind of funny. Can you smell it? Mm, it smells a bit burnt to me. You know what? This actually reminds me that we are pretty broken, we are in the darkness, and our hearts kind of look like this. Yeah. Um, life is full of uncertainties. We don't know if our cookies will come out like this, and our hearts are, um, yeah, pretty broken like this cookie. Hmm. Where does this come from, Naomi? You can sit down if you want. Our world is broken... Um, each of us are broken like this cookie, um, and that is because of sin. Sin is when we turn our backs on God. And this means that we have no hope? That's right. We are stuck. We're stuck in this darkness. We're stuck in this uncertainty. Like this cookie. Can this cookie change itself? No. No. I think this cookie actually just needs to go in the bin. We don't really want to eat it, do we? No. It's burnt, that's right. <laughs> but what you're saying is that at Easter we celebrate something changing. 
That's right. The Bible speaks about a wonderful promise that God gives. God says in Ezekiel that he'll give us a new heart and take away the old heart. Wow. I wonder, how does this happen? I wonder if anyone here can help me. Does anyone know why do we celebrate Easter? Yeah, what do you think? We remember that Jesus died on the cross and rose again. That's right. Jesus, God's son, came into the world. He died. He didn't stay dead, though. He rose again. Yeah, after two days. Um, And that means that if we believe in him, we can have new life too. We can have a new heart. Oh, so it's like being washed clean. Jesus comes into this world takes away sin and the darkness, and he gives us a new heart. Hmm, this reminds me of something else that I made, Naomi. Can I show it to you? Do you think this is going to be any better? No. We'll we'll see. Hmm. Do you want to have a look? Yeah. Can I have someone else to come up? Look, you want to come up? Oh, what's going to be? What is it? Can you hear that? It's a cookie, do you want to? Can you have a look? Show everyone. What's this one? What's different about this cookie? Yeah? It's white. Yeah. It's not burnt. That's right. Because of Jesus, we can have a new heart like this new cookie. You you can actually. In a minute though. (laughs) And so this is what gives us hope? Yeah, this hope, because Jesus died and rose again, we can have new hope. We can have a new heart. We can know what our future will be like, that we will be washed clean and actually have uh, life forever with Jesus. So this new heart means that I can know for certain that I can live forever with Jesus and this is the best hope that there is. It's the best hope, more certain than anything else. Wow, this is great news. Easter reminds me that I have a new life and a new heart because of what Jesus did. And it's even more certain than my parents giving me chocolate Easter eggs today. That's right. I'm going to say thank you to God and then we'll go out to Kids Church. Dear God, thank you so much for this new heart, for new life in Jesus. Thank you that today we celebrate Jesus dying and resurrecting uh, to give us um, this new heart. Amen. Yeah, we actually have cookies that we can give out, but we'll give them out to you a bit later. Thanks, Naomi. Thanks, Millie. So if all the kids, uh, we've got some exciting kids program for you. So if you want to get up and move to the back of the back of the church and your kids uh, church leaders will come and grab you and take you to your programs. If you are in year six and above, uh, you're going to stay with us. Uh, yay, that's great. Um, but we do have a little uh, little quiz for you to do. So if you haven't picked one up on the way, please put up your hand. If you're in grade six and above and you haven't got a quiz that's printed out, please put up your hand and Janani will come and give you one. I'm not seeing any hands up, so I assume that means everyone that's in year six and above. Ah, there's Mitch. (laughs) Uh, Is it the adult? Uh, If adults really wanted, you can. But it's mainly for year 6 to year 12. So so if you're in high school, basically. If you're in high school, please put up your hand, and Jenny will come and give you a little quiz. For everyone else, um, just there's there's lots there's lots of new people here, which is which is great, uh, and you may not have met everyone. Uh, so I would love for you to take this opportunity uh, to say hi to the person next to you. And if you want a question to discuss, just like um, uh, Millie and Naomi just told us about hope. This hope that Jesus gives us is not just a wishful thinking. It's not something that we hope will sort of happen. We know this with certainty that because Jesus has died and has resurrected, we can have security and certainty of our future. 
So we have, we have hope, uh, hope of various dreams about our lives. How do we know that those dreams are not just wishful thinking and they're actually something that we hope? So now we hope for various things. How do we know that they're not just wishful thinking? So if you want something to talk to the person next to you, you can use that question. Otherwise, just take the next minute to say hi to the person next to you. One of, the, um, one of the great things about, so, sorry for cutting off conversations, one of the great things about uh, us worshipping uh, a risen Lord uh, is that He lives and He speaks to us through His Word. And uh, we're going to spend the next, uh, next little while uh, reading from God's Word. Uh, and Ben's then going to come and teach us from that same passage. So Millie is going to come and read. And as Millie comes up, uh, let me pray and ask God uh, to be live and among us and teaching us the things that He wants us to learn. So please bow with me. Thank you, Father, for making yourself known to us, showing us the way of salvation through faith in your Son. We ask you now to teach us through your word so that we may be ready to serve you for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And the passage that Millie is about to read is printed, and it's in your outlines. Um, so there's Ezekiel chapter 36, and there's also Ezekiel chapter 37. Uh, Millie is going to be reading to us from Ezekiel chapter 37. Thank you. So, Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 to 14. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and these bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. 
Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that the Lord, that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. And it's great that we can look at Ezekiel 37 together. So let me pray and then let's have a look. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you speak to us in your word, the Bible, and you speak to us clearly. We pray now that you would quieten our hearts and our minds so that we can understand what it is that you want us to know about the hope that we can have because of Jesus. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now most of you should have an outline uh, as well as the passage printed out. And I'll be looking at Ezekiel 36 and 37. So please follow along as we go. Just to start with, I think it's not always very easy, is it, to evaluate our hopes and our dreams. It's not always easy to know whether they are right or even whether they are realistic. Uh, this has been the case throughout history. People have dreamed dreams and pinned hopes on very significant events. But I guess what about us as individuals and as families? I mean, all of us really in some way, shape or form, dream dreams and pin our hopes on our best laid plans. I think for most of you here, you don't need me to tell you that we make decisions and assess and hopefully stick to priorities in order to work at our dreams and our plans, in order to work at what will hopefully be a very good and prosperous future. Moving from one country to another in the pursuit of freedom uh, from many things and for many things, like the pursuit of a better life for our families. Uh, starting or growing a business, studying or upskilling to get better jobs and better pay, being able to find fulfillment in our work, paying off the small lottery that is an apartment in Sydney, setting up our financial future, achieving financial freedom and independence. I wonder what your hopes and dreams for the future look like. And, and as we think about hopes and dreams, how do we evaluate whether they are good or not? Are our dreams about the pursuit of good, what is good and right for ourselves and the community around us? Or if we are honest, are they self-centered? And then on top of that, what do these dreams even achieve? Is there any certainty or solid foundation in our hopes and in our dreams? And I start like this because when we see what God has to say about what hope really is and where hope can really be found, we see that everything changes. It changes because everything, our hopes, our confidence, our future expectations, all of these things are shaped by the reality of God. And what God says in His Word, the Bible, challenges everything. In fact, as we read in Ezekiel what God is like and what God is going to do, we might actually start to get scared and think that real hope is impossible. See, Ezekiel is speaking the words of God and he brought a message of hopelessness to his people. In the first half of Ezekiel, he brings a message of hopelessness to the people who are in exile in Babylon in the 6th century B.C. See, the people then had to learn the reality of God's judgment and that they were standing under that judgment. They had to learn that the wrath of God was being poured out on them just as our world has to learn that it stands under the wrath of God as well. And of course, when you realize that this is the reality of our situation, then you start to realize how futile our dreams and our hopes individually and collectively actually are. You see, when you realize what it is like in our situation, then maybe there aren't too many dreams to dream and there aren't that many hopes to have. But as we go back on this Easter Sunday to those dark Old Testament days, we are going to go back and see a miracle. Because out of the utter hopelessness of the judgment of God Himself, out of the wrath of God that is poured out on His people Israel in the 6th century, there comes hope. And it is real hope, not optimism, not this nonsense of jumping in the dark and hoping for the best. Real hope. It isn't make-believe, it is sound, solid, valid hope. And really, I think the questions that we want to ask as we dig into this are, 
Why did there turn out to be hope for the hopeless? And in fact, how could there be hope for the hopeless? So look at the answers with me in Ezekiel 36 and 37. We start with why did there turn out to be hope for the hopeless, and we start with the reality that it has to do with God's holiness. God's holiness is His perfection. And we'll see in verses 16 to 21 of Ezekiel 36 that two things flow out of the fact that God is holy and perfect. It will come up on the screen. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, when the people of Israel were living in their own land, they defiled it by their conduct and their actions. Their conduct was like a woman's monthly uncleanness in my sight. So I poured out my wrath on them because they had shed blood in the land and because they had defiled it with their idols. I dispersed them among the nations and they were scattered through the countries. I judged them according to their conduct and their actions. Now, in this brief statement, the conduct and the language might be a little strange to us. The language is based on a system of laws in the book of Leviticus. But the point, I think, is very straightforward, isn't it? God is holy. Israel, his chosen people, had lived in a way that was a mockery to God's holiness. They had lived in a way that was an affront to God's holiness. That's what the word defiled means. And so because God is holy, he has poured out his wrath on them. They have been punished, they have been judged. And that is, in fact, the first consequence of God's holiness. You can't mess around with a holy God. And then verse 20, And wherever they went among the nations, they profaned my holy name. For it was said of them, These are the Lord's people, and yet they had to leave his land. I had concern for my holy name, which the people of Israel profaned among the nations where they had gone. And this then is the second consequence of God's holiness and also the reason why God's judgment isn't actually his final word. God is holy, God is perfect, but what happens to God's holiness and his perfection when the people of God are scattered and are in effect destroyed by judgment? Well, that too is a mockery of God's holiness. Not because there is anything morally wrong with sinners being judged that is perfectly right. Sinners have gone and will go to hell, but for the saving work of God in Jesus. That isn't actually the problem. The problem is that the people of Israel, God's people, were God's people based on God's promises. Centuries ago, God promised to their forefather Abraham that he would bless Abraham, and through Abraham bring blessing to all the families of the earth. And that was God's perfect purpose in bringing the people of Israel, His chosen people, into existence. And now Israel has been scattered among the nations. They have been judged as a result of their stubborn rebellion. And God says, wherever you went among the nations, you profaned my holy name. It's not because they went around blaspheming God, but actually it is because the perfect purpose of the Word of God seemed to have come to nothing. His reputation had taken a hit because his perfect purpose seemingly had not been achieved. And this then is the second consequence of God's holiness. His judgment will not be his final word. Not if his perfect purpose, not if his promises are something different to that judgment. So, what is the ground for hope that God's people Israel might have? Verse 22, therefore say to the Israelites, this is what the sovereign Lord says, it is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I am going to do these things. You see what God is saying? We like to put ourselves at the center of things and think that we can build our self-esteem up because God loves us and so that means that we are worthy. We must be worthy, otherwise why would God do this? See, if we weren't worthy, then God wouldn't love us. But that logic is wrong. The people of Israel and us here today have to understand that that is not what it's like. It is not they who are at the heart of what God will do. Look at what it says. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I am going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which you have been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy 
through you before their eyes. Don't miss what God says here. Year 11 and 12 English should have really drilled this into you. If you're in the education system here, repetition is important. And there are two very key things. God does things for the sake of His holy name, and we don't do anything to achieve it because we were profaned among the nations. And He says it over and over again so that we will really understand it. And these words also come to us today. They are words that come into the New Testament into a form of prayer that if you've been at church for a while, you'll be familiar with. Hallowed be your name. Vindicate your holiness. Show us your perfection. It is a prayer that God's judgment will come. If His name is going to be hallowed, then He will judge evil. He will judge sinners. But also the prayer is the fulfillment of God's perfect purposes. Show us your holiness. Show us your perfection. Hallowed be your name. And then Ezekiel gives us four reasons or four things that God will do to vindicate His holy name. The four I will statements. The first one, verse 24. For I will take you out of the nations, I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. And the key thing here is that God will gather and bring the people to Himself. And if you listen very carefully, you can hear the word of Jesus saying, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Or the word of Jesus that says, All to whom the Father gives will come, and whoever comes I will never, ever let them go. Or the word of Jesus, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. And in verse 25, I will sprinkle clean water on you. And you will be clean, and I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. You see, with clean, pure water, God will wash dirty people of their guilt and of their impurities. And again, if you listen carefully, this time to the Apostle Paul, the New Testament word, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or, it gets even better, verse 26, I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove from your heart of stone. Sorry, I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. The heart that is stubborn and rebellious and rejecting God, God will replace it. And again, if you listen carefully to the words of the New Testament, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, the new is here. And then verse 27, and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Do you see? Because God is perfect and holy, He will do all of these things. And He will do it for the sake of His holy name. Now, you would think that this should just give us a lot of reason to praise and rejoice. But I think the outcome of all this is not what we would expect. When you hear that God is going to gather His people to Himself and sprinkle clean water on them and give them a new heart and put His Spirit within them, and that is all for you, then you would think it would be joy and rejoicing. But actually, as we have been taken to the very heart of God's promises, displays as His holiness, here is the outcome. Verse 31, Then you will remember your evil ways and wicked deeds and you will loathe yourselves for your sins and detestable practices. I want you to know that I am not doing this for your sake, declares the Sovereign Lord. Be ashamed and disgraced for your conduct, people of Israel. See, there is something terribly wrong, isn't there, when our pride can persist in God's grace to us. There's something terribly wrong when we think that we are doing heaps of good stuff to achieve something. See, it's not because we are worthy of it. And if we see His grace to us, and if we see His kindness to us, and we see His love to us, and see why He does all of these things, then our pride must be shattered. And so the very last sentence of the chapter, right at the end of the printed thing, then they will know that I am the Lord. That's the purpose of all of this. Then they will know that I am the Lord. See, all of the things that we hope and we dream for ought to be destroyed by the news that God will be God 
and that we will all know that he is God. See, God promises to save us because he is God, because he is holy, because it was his purpose for the sake of his holy name. And that is, in fact, why Jesus came for us. That's why God has gathered us into his family by the gospel. And that is why we will look forward to the perfect fulfillment of all of his promises. And so we hear the words of Ezekiel through the centuries transformed and applied to us. And it sounds like this. It is not for your sake, O oh followers of Jesus, that I am going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name. But also understand that that same reality will establish real and true hope. Not based on our hopes and dreams, real hope. See, how can we leave here this morning knowing that God says that we are under judgment and really believe there is real hope? How can we realistically face the future with hope and with confident expectation? How could an Israelite in Ezekiel's day have hope, knowing that Jerusalem, the great city where all their hopes were, was now burning rubble and ruined? And here's where we get to our Bible reading, Ezekiel chapter 37, starting at verse 1. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. See, here is a vision for the prophet Ezekiel, and it is a horrific vision. When you look at this, don't think pretty bones. Think horrible bones all over a valley. These are dry bones. All the moisture has been taken out of them. It is as, as close as you can get to. They are dead, dead bones. Basically, you can't get any more dead than the death that is in this vision. And in the midst of all the death comes a ridiculous question to the point of being an unbelievable question. Verse 3, he asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? That is, Ezekiel, is there a future for what you are looking at? Can there be hope in this valley of just dry bones that are dead, dead? And the question really is an unbelievable question. It's sort of like going with a friend to Rookwood Cemetery, going right into the middle, and then asking if all the dead people will live. Craziness. But it is the sort of the question that should come to our mind when we look out on our world who is sitting in, under the judgment of God. You see, the world is literally dead people walking. Is there true and lasting hope in our world who will face God's judgment? If God is against the world, what hope is there really? See, as Ezekiel looks out on this valley of dry, decrepit, rotting bones, he hears the question, the Son of Man, can these bones live? And I think Ezekiel replies with some restraint and care, I guess because God is the one who's asking the question. And it might sound like a ridiculous question to us, but Ezekiel answers in a way that doesn't transfer his ignorance and impotence to God. And so he answers in the most gentle and safe way possible, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. But notice that even though he doesn't say it's a ridiculous question, he also doesn't give us any suggestions. He doesn't do what we do with the hopes of our world. He doesn't say, well, here's what we do. We change the tax policy, and we reshape social structures, and we redistribute the wealth, and then things will be better. Obviously, they will be. And the reality that even if these things are a little bit better for a little while, it doesn't last. Social reform is temporary at best, but social reform will mean nothing when God comes to judge the world. And it is all certainly futile once you see God's word on the true condition of the world. Whether you pay more tax or less tax, whether wealth is redistributed fairly or unfairly, in the end, everything rests on what God says is going to happen. And we are a world destined for judgment. And so then we read verses 4 to 10. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones, I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. 
I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and these bones came together bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come, breathe from the four winds, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Now that's an amazing vision for Ezekiel to see. Dead, dead, dry bones with nothing turned into a vast army. And then now you understand the point of the question, Son of Man, can these bones live? Of course they can live. Should God, the sovereign creator, choose to bring them to life? Can these bones live? Yes. Should God, by His powerful word and His life-giving breath, bring them to life? Can there be hope in the valley of death? Yes. But only one hope, if God Himself gives His word. I will make breath into you, and you will come to life. The only guy that could breathe life in, and He does it. He promises that it will happen, and that is where true hope lies. And what exactly is Ezekiel talking about? It's not a general prediction of life after death. Verse 11, Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Their hope was gone. All the promises, all of them feel, felt like they were dashed. They were in a foreign place. The temple was destroyed. Their king was gone. It seemed like God was out. That valley that Ezekiel saw with the dry bones is a picture of the people of Israel under God's judgment, a picture of the hopelessness, hopelessness of life when you work out that God's judgment is real. How can there be hope in God's judgment? Can these bones live? And you know that if it's a picture of the exile, it is also a picture of our world. See, as the New Testament says, our condition is that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. We are to understand that we are living in that valley. Death is everywhere. Death is seemingly winning. The wages of sin is death, and we, our world, is sinful, thoroughly sinful. We stand under God's judgment. And so can there be hope for Israel in exile? Can there be hope for human beings in this world? Yes. Verse 12, Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says, My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up out from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my Spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, decrees, declares the Lord. See, yes, there can be hope, but there can only be one hope. Only if God should give a promise that by His word He will bring life out of death. There is no other hope. And can you see that what the prophet Ezekiel is actually doing is preaching the gospel. The God who has come to Ezekiel in the 6th century BC has now come into our world in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the New Testament, we hear that the promises of God have found their fulfillment in the death and resurrection of Jesus. The old has gone and the new has come. And this is from God who reconciles himself to us through Jesus on the cross. And so, as we hear this same word of Ezekiel in the pages of the New Testament, we come again to the cross where Jesus died, to another valley of death, Golgotha, a place where we hear, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this morning we remember that God did, by His power and by His life-giving Spirit, raise Jesus from the dead. And then we hear what the New Testament says about it, and it will come up on the screen. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. 
And so as Ezekiel prophesies over the valley of the dry bones, son of man, prophesy to these bones. So in the same way, the gospel must be preached to our dead world. See, the reality is that dry, rotting bones have no greater need than the life-giving breath of the gospel word. See, it brings life. It has brought life to all of you here who trust in Jesus, who believe in Jesus. And it will bring life to any one of us here this morning who has not yet been brought to life. Trust that Jesus can bring this life. And that is then, in fact, my question. Is that your hope? Is your hope in God who raised Jesus from the dead? Is your hope in the resurrection of Jesus? Or to use the words of Ezekiel, is your hope based in what God has done for you because of his holiness, for the sake of his holy name? And is your hope on what he will yet do because of his promise? You see, the reality is that our dreams and hope for this life are practically useless if we understand the state of the world. What difference does it be if you have a medical degree or a law degree or seven properties in Sydney or a million dollars in your bank account if God will come and judge and you will face his judgment? They are practically pointless if they do not take God and his perspective into account. You see, it is only in God that we have a sound, solid, valid hope that is shaped by his promises. So is this the news that you live by? Is this gospel of the crucified and resurrected Jesus what shapes your dreams and your hopes? Because this Easter Sunday, let me plead with you that you need to make sure now that it is. For you see the words of Jesus, what does it profit a person to gain the whole world but lose his soul? There is no other hope worth having. Now, if you would like to grab, this, ho- grab hold of this hope by trusting in Jesus for the first time, then we would love to give you that opportunity. I'm going to close by praying a prayer, and this prayer will come up on the screen. Uh, in this prayer, we will say sorry to God for the ways in which we live, a way that rejects Him, a way that profanes His holy name, a way that prioritizes ourselves above Him. We will also ask Him for forgiveness. And say thank you to Jesus that in his death and resurrection we can be in relationship with God. So, please pray this quietly. I will give some time after each line for you to then also follow and pray if you would like to. So let's pray together. Dear Father God, I'm sorry that I've rejected you in how I live and prioritized my hopes and dreams above you. I'm sorry for my sin. Thank you that Jesus died and rose again, that I can be in a restored relationship with you. Please forgive me and change me. Help me to live as one of your children in your family. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
church. Um, we're going to be praying now. Um, we'll be praying for Easter, uh, for our sister Aicha, um, for those um, on school holidays and those who are struggling with loneliness at this time. So please join me in prayer. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you great thanks and praise for sending Jesus as our great Saviour, shedding his blood that we might live. We know that we are undeserving, yet you still pursued us to reconcile us to you. We ask, Lord, that those around us, at work, school, in our communities, in our nation and around the world, those who don't yet know you might come to know the true hope of Easter, that it's only by Jesus' death and resurrection that we can be free from sin and death. And we know, Lord, you are a powerful God and you can bring many more souls into your kingdom. Father, we give you great thanks for our sister Aicha and for your transforming work in her life. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to teach her your ways and grow her in her understanding of you and enable her to continue to bless others through her service of you. Lord, we also bring before you our families and children who are on school holidays at the moment. Please give them a time of refreshment, um, time together as a family. Give them patience and grace as they spend more time together, that they might show love to each other um, and that it would be an encouraging time. Lord, we also bring before you those who are struggling with loneliness over this long weekend. Be their ever-present help and comforter. Help them to rely on you in their pain. May the knowledge of Jesus, our suffering saviour, give them comfort at this time. And finally, Father, continue to refresh our hearts with the amazing love you have for us. Help us to share this love with those that you have put in our path. And we bring all these prayers to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Lana. And uh, thank you, Aicha, for sharing that beautiful uh, story uh, with us. And um, Aicha's transformed life has been a great encouragement uh, to so many of us at church. Uh, and if, you've, uh, if you're here today and you've been encouraged by what you heard from uh, God's Word in Ezekiel, uh, and you, especially if you prayed that prayer, uh, we would love to hear from you. So in your outlines, uh, there, is a, there is a Connect card, uh, and I would love for you to take the next two minutes uh, to fill that out. Uh, and if you want to know more about this hope that Aicha talked about, the hope that Ben talked to us about from Ezekiel 37, uh, you want to know more about the church, uh, there are boxes for you to tick, and so please take the next uh, minute or two to fill that, and then Janani and Pauline will come and collect them from you. And if you need a pencil, please raise your hands and Pauline will come and give you one. There are pencils in the um, seats in front of you, but if, you, if, if there isn't one, please raise your hand. All right, so as you're, as you're writing uh, and as uh, Janani and Pauline come to collect the cards from you, uh, I just want to remind you that the next uh, couple of weeks, uh, our student ministers at church uh, will be preaching to us uh, from the book of Haggai. 
Uh, so please come along uh, to hear more of what God has to say to us. Um, and we're going to keep singing and keep praising God. As we've, uh, as, as we've heard today, uh, we, could, we could praise God forever, uh, for He has done great things. So I'm going to invite the music team again, uh, and we're going, to pr- uh, we're going to praise God singing, or praise the name of the Lord our God, or praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise, O Lord, O Lord our God. my mind to Calvary where she just bled and died for me I see his wounds his heavy feet my Savior Lord and who is he to The praising sun. 